大家好, don't worry, uh, today's talk will not be in Chinese. Uh, welcome to the first uh, first ever Kellogg China Insider Forum. We are we at the Chinese Business Club are so excited to welcome you today. Uh, we have so much in store uh, to give you a special glimpse into the journey that China has been on. The goal of this forum is to provide perspective as well as insight into uh, the broader innovation of the Chinese market. We have an amazing lineup of speakers, panelists, as well as professors here today to share with uh, all of us. So I'm Jessica, I'm your MC for this afternoon. Um, before Kellogg, I worked at Apple for five years in China in Shanghai. Uh, a quick few announcements. Uh, as many know, our policy here is please no phone, silent, no laptops, uh, no recording. We, we have already amazing photographers and recorders here for us as well. Um, as well as timeliness, uh, we will be taking a short break, which when I walk over the schedule, um, we'll ask everyone to come back within that short time because speakers have very few precious minutes to kind of share with us their thoughts. So that's our, our main announcements. Um, and so just going over today's schedule, uh, we have an opening remarks by Phil, Philip Levy, um, we have a keynote by Maggie Tan, um, and then we'll go into a panel um, that um, Angela will be walking through with us, and then we'll have a final keynote by uh, Kevin. And many of these speakers have flown in from Beijing, Shanghai, LA, San Francisco. So uh, we are. Why don't we give them a quick round of applause for just that? Um, <laughs> and following that, we'll have networking. So I would now like to introduce Phil Levy, our Kellogg Professor on Strategy for Opening Remarks. He was a senior fellow on Chicago Council for Global Affairs. So, thank you, fellow. All right, well, thank you very much, Ni Hao. It, it's a real uh, honor and a pleasure to be here to launch this discussion. I think the China Business Club has put together an exciting and, and impressive array of speakers on a very important topic. Um, I think the topic of digital innovation in China is a particularly interesting one. It can highlight all the tremendous advances that the Chinese that we've seen in Chinese business advances, which are sometimes ignored in U.S. political discourse. Um, but I think it can also demonstrate the extent to which true global success for Chinese companies is going to depend on improved commercial diplomacy with the United States and the rest of the world. Um, that gets a little closer to some of the stuff that I tend to work on. So what I thought I would do in some brief opening remarks here is say a word or two about what I see as China's great advantages um, in the digital realm, some of the hurdles that it'll face, and then perhaps a word or two about the state of U.S.-China political relations. Um, this is, of course, a very timely uh, topic given the summit meeting um, that is about to begin um, between President Xi Jinping and President Donald Trump. All right, so let me start with what I think are the real uh, advantages that, that China enjoys in the digital realm. The most obvious advantage is the size of the Chinese market, um, full of consumers uh, with an appetite for innovation and a willingness to try new approaches. I think one of the things that we've sometimes seen if we look at digital commerce around the world is that it can offer an opportunity for um, newcomers to leapfrog established businesses um, in, in countries. Because when you have some countries where there are sort of very well-established traditions, you shop at a brick and mortar store, you make sense, um, those can be hard, those, those habits can be hard to break. Whereas newcomers uh, can, can sort of jump right to the cutting edge, and I think that's often what we've seen in China. And I think that's part of the explanation um, for why you've seen so many uh, very impressive tech giants emerge in China. Of course, the other part of that so that part of the fertile ground, the other part of that is uh, real ingenuity and an entrepreneurial skill. Um, but the result has been that you've had very impressive, world-class uh, firms emerging uh, in, the, in the digital realm. And so but that leads to a question. It's, it's a very natural question for the, the course that I teach here at Kellogg, which is on international business strategy. So the question is, is it enough for, say, an Alibaba or a Tencent to dominate the Chinese market? Um, so, or do they need to then sort of move on to the rest of the world? Um, I think there are a number of problems with trying to 
remain a purely local player. Uh, foremost among them, you know, with the Chinese, uh, in a sort of macroeconomic perspective, what the Chinese market is notable for is a relatively low level of consumption and a high level of investment, um, which is why you often have sort of outward facing strategies. Um, it, it's also the case that even if you can be successfully inward facing, you don't have to deal with market saturation, you have to operate in a market where your competitors are often global players and taking advantage of. Um, uh, of both the, the innovations that they see elsewhere and the learning that takes place as they address other market needs. So whatever we decide theoretically about this, I think empirically it's pretty well established that China's new digital types have been eager to, to sort of go abroad. So, um, and that's where, I'm, where I see some of the most important hurdles um, that, that are faced for, for China's digital companies. Um, but to my mind, the key hurdle that they face is trust. I think there's a difference between producing t-shirts um, versus handling digital payments or electronic commerce. With the clothing, what you see is more or less what you get. With digital services, that's really not so true. And to me, the lack of trust was most clearly illustrated by the case of Huawei in the United States. That I think this was a globally successful telecommunications firm that was effectively blacklisted by the US government. Um, where the US government, the Commerce Department, the security community made clear that no one should really do business with Huawei. There was suspicion about the extent of its ties with the Chinese government, um, and that really precluded um, a number of markets which it would naturally have been a top competitor for. That's not a unique example. Um, we've seen increased pressure to run investment deals through the US security screen, through CFIUS, you know, for investment in the United States. Um, and this, this tension is not limited to the United States. You've also seen deals with Chinese firms questioned in, in places recently like Australia and Germany. Um, so I think this is a challenge that China is going to need to address through policy. I think there needs to be greater transparency and new global agreements on appropriate commercial behavior and security concerns. In an ideal world, this would take place at the World Trade Organization. Until that happens, I think Chinese tech leaders uh, in this facet will be at a global disadvantage in competition to beyond Chinese borders. All right, so let me add this sort of a final point, turn to where do we stand with diplomatic relations um, and, and the summary, perhaps, it's about to commence. So it would be very nice if, they, if uh, this weekend's opportunity, this visit was a, an opportunity for mature discussions about just the sorts of concerns I, I outlined. I think there's probably too much to hope for given the present state of this administration. And I, I don't mean that entirely as a commentary on the people who are there in the administration as much as a commentary on the people who are not there in this administration, which is, this is for those who have not spent a great deal of time in Washington, this is one of the more notable points, is that normally preparing for a summit, you would think who was the team that would accompany, you would have you know, an undersecretary of state for political affairs, have the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, and you would this counterparts in the Treasury Department who think this, those positions simply haven't been, they've been neither filled nor not even nominated yet. So um, there will be an interesting asymmetry as these discussions begin. It's also the case, however, that in its public pronouncements, the new U.S. administration uh, has fixated on issues that are either irrelevant, and here I will just the bilateral trade deficit. Um, or outdated, such as charges of currency manipulation. So I think mean, if we are fortunate, the summit is going to proceed diplomatically. Um, the most we can probably hope for is a handshake and a few Twitter-worthy investment deals. Um, if we get that, we're probably doing fairly well. Um, there actually is a great deal to talk about in the sign of the U.S. economic relationship, but I expect most of the productive diplomacy is going to have to wait for another day. All right. So. One of the perks of being a leadoff speaker is I get to raise issues and questions without having to solve them. Um, <laughs> fortunately, uh, our organizers have pulled together an excellent uh, set of speakers, and I won't make you wait any further to get to them. I'm certainly eager to hear what they have to say on, on, the, on topics of uh, digital innovation and the Chinese consumers. So um, with that, uh, we will begin with a keynote address by Jin Kang, the former head of operations strategy and founding member of Uber China.